The 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution provided for a woman's right to vote. 100 years later, Heather Fargo and Diana Madoshi joined me to talk about how women are increasing their involvement in politics, from voting to discussion and running for office, next on Studio Sacramento. For over 20 years, Five Star Bank has created thoughtful solutions to help the capital region thrive. From economic development and education to public health and safety, issues that are vitally important to Sacramento's prosperity. We're proud to be part of the conversation and hope you'll join in. Mayor Fargo, Hillary Clinton's loss in 2016 had a profound effect upon you. What was it about that election that spurred you to action to form uh, with others the Capital Women's Campaign? Well, the first couple of years after her loss uh, was pretty depressing, and a lot of my friends shared that concern, and frankly, we didn't think the next day of news would be worse. And What was so depressing about it? It was depressing not only that she lost when we thought we had someone who was so qualified uh, and so smart and so ready for the position, uh, to lose to someone who, from my point of view, was clearly not ready to be our president. And the impacts have been profound, and a lot of us here in Sacramento want to make a difference. We want to see a change, and we think we can make that happen. And making that sort of change and involving more women in the political process yeah. While this campaign is new, Diana, and first off, I want to compliment you on your outfit, and we'll have to hear a little bit about that. But, Thank you. Uh, th but the history uh, of women in this country is not that political action and uh, getting involved and running for office is new. This has been a part of our country for a very long time. Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, precisely. Uh, when people say that or when I meet someone to say that I'm not political and I said, you're married, got a family, it's all part of negotiation, it's all policies. When someone says I don't like politicians, I say, uh, politicians make policies, policies affect you, education. So, but for me on the historical uh, point of view for a long time, Many women were not aware, and they still are learning about the contributions of women. And not just in politics, but in science, uh, other education. industries, education, um, and even that fact that before we became a nation, there was a period of time that women did vote for their school boards. Really? That. Yes. I didn't know that. And an uh, interesting thing, as with Washington State, when it was a territory, the women had the right to vote. When it became a state, they lost that right, and then they had to work hard for suffrage again. And suffrage means, you know, the right to vote. And, and tell us a little bit about uh, the outfit that you're wearing and the work of your organization. Okay. Um, the white outfit is for the women and the voting. The, um, these were colors that Alice Paul and the suffragist women, they wore banners. This says, women win the vote. And next year will be 2020, the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, the passage of the 19th Amendment. And that was very important because that gave women universal right to vote. Although all women were not able to exercise that right to vote, like with uh, Native Americans, who were not, Native American women were not citizens yet. They were still working out the treaties with the United States government. And there was the Chinese Exclusion Act uh, that prevented Chinese, Filipinos, people of the uh, the Pacific Rim from voting. Also, when with the passage of the 19th Amendment, all blacks were not able to vote. Now, there were pockets in the country where they could, but in the South, primarily in the South and some places in the North, that 
black men and women start facing more uh, opposition and more uh, voter oppression, which still goes on today in some manner of the other. And so by, I know that um, you know, colleagues of yours do historical reenactment yes. of famous women throughout history. Mm -hmm. But overall, what is the mission that you all want to accomplish our by your work? Our mission, basically, I can sum it up with writing women back into history. We've always been part of the history. Pause for just a sec. Okay. Writing women back into history. That's correct. That's correct. What does that really mean? What it means is that if you, if I look at history as I learned it when I was coming up, Bessie Ross supposedly made the flag. Um, not that many things about Martha, uh, Dolly, Dolly Madison to, uh, escaped the fire with uh, uh, George Washington's portrait, but none of the significant important things that women done. We didn't learn about the, uh, the women that were uh, doctors. We did not learn about the women scientists. Later on I heard about uh, Madame Curie, but there was a lot of women that have done significant things and most women and men are not aware of. And wow. when, you know, as an African American, like with history, we had history, but I was not hearing about our contribution either. And so when, when um, a child or girl reads the history books and they don't see them in it, it, diminishing their, it diminishes their worthiness of how but they see themselves. Connect that though back to this moment in time mm -hmm. where it is that um, it appears that there is a lot of action on the part of women getting involved in politics. Right yes. after the 2016 election, there was that march. Yes, right. I was there. Oh, you were there, okay. Mm -hmm. And um, we saw in the last election between the presidentials, there's been a tremendous amount uh, of activity in terms of female candidates running. Absolutely, yes. What is it about this moment in history that's different than others, that's stimulating women to really not only step up onto the stage, and not saying that they haven't in the past, we just haven't heard about mm -hmm. it, but to step up on the stage in a way that seems, it just seems different. I think part of it is that a lot of women feel under attack, and we also feel that both the democ democracy and the future of the world is at risk, and it's a really important, critical time for us to step up. Uh, women tend to be more empathetic. We tend to look a little broader at the impacts of things. Uh, more women are concerned about climate change than men. Um, we have a different view of the world and we don't think that our concerns, whether it's about families or children, children immigrants at the border, are being taken seriously and are being treated right in Washington. And we know we can do a better job and, and it's our turn. And they're recognizing that they have to be part of policy making that in order to be a part of the policy making, you're gonna to have to run for office, whether it's local, uh, from all different uh, levels of government. In order, if you're not involved, uh, you, uh, you're part of the, the situation where you're not accomplishing anything. Uh, I think someone says if, if you're not involved, you, uh, you, you're on the menu. <laughs> so, so with that, that's what a friend had, uh, says to me. I might not be getting it quite right, but she said, oh, no, you know, if you're not involved, you're going to be part of the menu. Sound, it sounds accurate to yeah. me. So in order to not be on the menu, yes. what is the Capital Women's Campaign doing? Well, our, our coalition is of women in the Capital Region, and we're trying to educate, to engage, to uh, empower and to elect women. Uh, we just had a celebration of the 99th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, uh, and we'll be engaged in, in celebrations of that down the road, making sure that we educate women about what they can do. Um, 
it, but the, we're also doing a training next month, uh, October 26th, we're having a training to teach women how to work in campa campaigns, how to run campaigns. Um, there's other groups that are recruiting women to run for office and training candidates. We're trying to, ca to uh, cater to and train the people that are gonna work in campaigns, hopefully for women. Uh -huh. uh, because there are mostly, most of the campaign consultants are men. Um, they don't always understand what we're trying to do. Um, and they have a different view of the world. And so we think that women need to step up not only as candidates, not only as voters, but actually running those campaigns. They know their communities, they know their neighbors, they know how to do this. Uh, most campaign workers, I, probably for all times, have been w women, mostly mm -hmm. in volunteer positions. We think it's time for them to learn how to do it professionally and how to be more involved in the marketing, the field operations, the, the, the data analysis, um, all of those things that we do. We've been really good at voter registration and really good at education um, and really good at volunteering our time, but that time is valuable. And how how, should be how do you think training the people that actually support it, the candidates is going to, to make a difference? You, you talked about how you know, men, most of the campaign consultants, actually I'd say overwhelmingly mm -hmm. campaign consultants yeah. tend, tend to be men yeah. on, on a bipartisan basis. Absolutely, yeah. What do you think that typically gets missed that this effort by uh, the Capital Women's Campaign is going to address that, frankly, they can't seem to get it right? Well, it's not that they don't always get it right. I think there's a difference in, um, well, certainly it's about the whole employment food chain. So it's about who does the printing and who does the marketing and who does the graphics and, and all of those things. Um, but it's also the message. It's delivering the message. And I think that, that women, the messages that we want to share out there are just a little different. We're, we're less focused, we're not unconcerned about national defense, but we're not focused on war. Um, I mean, I wish we were building soccer fields in some of these Middle Eastern countries instead of, you know, blowing up their homes mm -hmm. of people where somebody might be hiding. Um, it's it's an incredible waste. But very much of what goes on in this country is very male-based, both from a political point of view and a corporate point of view. And if you want to make money building arms, you've got to have a war going on. So maybe we'd rather spend our money on other priorities. Maybe we're more concerned about children, about health care, about a woman's access you know, to complete health care, um, about the Equal Rights Amendment. There are, there's some serious business that affects women that has not been addressed. When, Diana, when you go out and you and your colleagues, you, uh, you know, meet with groups or do the historical reenactments and things like that, what surprises you that women don't even know about their history and their contributions to this country and their involvement in politics? Okay, uh, let me start with the surprises. Usually what we do, each, uh, the National Women's History Alliance, when it was formerly the National Women's History Project, we, we started in 1980. S started off as a week of education, then it became a month, and also each president since Carter has uh, proclaimed March's Women's History Month since then. And we, in March, we also do honorees. We may uh, pick a particular area. It might be uh, honoring women in education, honoring women in science, honoring women in, um, in, uh, uh, for the vote, which will be next, uh, next, uh, next year. Um, all of these honorees that we end up picking and we go through, we ask people to nominate someone, and we go through, and then not only are we educating, we're learning ourselves because a lot of it was not taught to us. And so when we go out to the community and we uh, present information about these accomplishments of so many women, like the, the simple thing, like the woman that prevented the Kevlar jacket, you know, that police wear. Really? It was a woman. Uh, smallpox, pneumonia vaccine. It was a woman. And so all of those things are really surprising to women because they did not hear that. In the, they did not hear it in the, in the textbooks. 
And that was one of the things that motivated the women, the five women that started the National Women's History Project, which is, as I say, is now the National Women's History when, Alliance. When young women get information like that, what's the effect on them? Pride. I've seen it. A pride, a sense of wow. And a sense of possibility. And a sense of possibilities. Yeah, maybe I could do And that. they can do it. It encouraged future generations. It encouraged them uh, about, um, I have a granddaughter. And usually a lot of times you do this stuff at home, it's not exactly appreciated. Now she's in high school and she had to do a paper on something, on one of the women. And so she called me <laughs> and she said to me, uh, wait, we'll go back before, we'll go back even before that. 2016, I was a delegate uh, at the, uh, at the uh, convention, Hillary Clinton. I thought I had my phone off. During the midst of the nomination, I got a call from my granddaughter. Phone, got through. Grandma, I get it. Hmm. Women, we deserve a place at the table. Wow. Women. That's my granddaughter. Hmm. That's wonderful. Uh -huh. I'm sure you inspired uh, a, a couple of young women along the way. <laughs> I hope so. From being the mayor, but I, I have to ask you, when we, we talk about running for elective office right. and being involved in the creation of policy, does it surprise you at all that on Sacramento City Council today there's only one woman on that council? You know, it doesn't surprise This is supposed to be such a, a city that is forward-leaning, yeah. right? Yeah, it is. What does that say? Well, it's disappointing. I mean, it's, it's not so much surprising as it disappoints me, and I'm, I'm hoping that we will, can change that this next year. There are some women running for city council here now, um, and I'm hoping we get back to that, uh, to having more women on the council, because it makes a difference. It makes a difference on what priorities are focused on um, and, and who's hired and you know, what the events are and all of those things. And, um, you know, we finally, there's a, another organization, the Coalition for the Advancement of Women and Children in Sacramento that has recently been successful in, in lobbying to get the child care coordinator position back at the city, at city hall. And that's a really important thing. It was one of the main things that keeps women from working full time and advancing in their careers is the, both the cost and unavailability of quality child care. And so well, we used to have that at the city. We don't have it anymore. And um, I'm looking forward to more women returning to the council. But one other fact you may not know, the first city council woman in, elected in California and possibly in the United States was right here in Sacramento. Who's that? In 1912, she was the first of the 12 women that have ever served on the city council. We've only had 12 for all history. 12 and three mayors. Right. Right. You, Bell Coolidge, and Ann Rudin, and Ann right? Rudin. Mm -hmm. and, and only Ann and I were elected at large. Bell was elected by the city council because she uh -huh. was before districts and before citywide mayor's election. Well, I might, I might argue that maybe that's more impressive because she didn't have the benefit of anybody else on that council voting for her that was female. That's true. That's true. No, not to diminish any of your significant accomplishments. I don't, but, I don't but, feel but, diminished. But, but, <laughs> That, but yeah, I didn't know that. That's yeah, and there was, a, there was a book written about her this last year, Llewellyn, Llewellyn Williams, who um, only served a year, but it was 1912. Mm -hmm. It was before women mm -hmm. had the right to vote nationally. California had the right to vote. Mm -hmm. And she ran in Sacramento. The first year women had the right to vote, and she won. Uh, so we have a history you, here. Mm -hmm. if, if there is uh, a woman who is joining us right now and has an interest in participating, what, what should she do? Well, I used to tell this to women of all ages, including you know girls in school. You need to know how to write, you need to know how to read, you need to know how to communicate, um, you know, both in writing and speaking. You need to be good at public speaking. You need to be able to put your thoughts together uh, and to have ideas. Um, and you need to work your community. You need to work in the community and work for the community. Um, and that can start in any number of things. And, and I, you know, women can be a part of changing Sacramento, whether or not they're elected, by voting, by volunteering, by right, being but, involved but, in all But give us, if, if you were sitting here with a young woman right now, Diana's granddaughter, 
and she wanted to start the path toward elective office. Appre appreciate everything that you just said, but what would you say is one, two, and three that she needs to do over the next whatever amount of time? Okay, I think she needs to join and be active in her neighborhood or community association. Um, she needs to get involved in one of a number of environmental organizations. Uh, and she needs to get herself appointed to um, a commission at the city council and preferably the planning commission. Okay, all right. It all goes <laughs> back to voting. It all goes back to education. It all goes back to knowing where you've been. When you know your history of where you've been, what you have been able to accomplish, and be curious about what you can do and want to make changes with policies. And that's why we're so, ex a number of us are really excited when we see more women yeah. uh, getting into the politics from 2018. And we see more, uh, I think one organization said that they had about 40,000 women. 40,000. That's a lot. 40,000 women recently have contacted this particular organization about help to run for some type of uh, elective office. You, you've uh, studied a lot of history, and I know that well, you I'm and your still, colleagues... still learning. Yeah, <laughs> you and your colleagues share a lot. One thing that I, I wanted to ask you about, though, is that in going back to what you said earlier about writing women back into history, mm -hmm. um, how, they're, they're, how do you respond to those who say, you know, this is just another extension of the overly politically correct society we live in today where it is that we're not satisfied until every single uh, group or subdivision of society has a place in, in the book and that this is just overkill. What would you say to that? It's not truly American history, not unless everyone is included because we've all had a part of making this country what it is. And the more we learn about all of our various histories, the more we will be able to go forth and become a better nation. That's my strong belief, that you have to be curious about where you've been and know about your background. So you don't repeat a lot of the mistakes but you can also learn, you learn. And as a nation, when we, when we uh, become more interested in the, 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 the history of the Native Americans, the history of the Asian Americans, the history of LBGTQ Americans, the history of uh, African Americans, the history of the European Americans. We are all part of the making of this country and we're far better when we know all of the components that have been involved in making this country what it is. Does that also involve though sometimes having some uncomfortable conversations because in learning about the history of, of folks that were not written in, mm -hmm. it also speaks to those who were doing the writing at the time. Sure. And, I, and, mm -hmm. and I've read recently that, for instance, at some of the homes of the Founding Fathers, that there's been a, a bit of a stiff reaction because of the fact that uh, they're having to account for more than just their achievements, but also where it is that they fell short. Mm -hmm. uh, how, when we were having these conversations, is that something that comes up frequently or is that something that it is just kind of a, a very small segment of the experiences that you encounter? It, it depends on the audience. Some people are more receptive and they're curious and they say, wow, I didn't know that. A neighbor of mine was talking recently about how she did not know about the Japanese internment. Wow. And really? she was reading. She was from the Midwest. She did not know. And I did not make her feel small about it. She was reading an interesting book and she wanted to know more. 
that's a good thing. On the other hand, some people don't want to recognize the fact that slavery was a horrible thing. It's a stain on our country. I mean, we had one book publisher having a book in Texas that referred to slaves as guest workers coming from Africa. <laughs> and I don't know. And they could hardly have been guest really? workers because they couldn't <laughs> leave on their own. <laughs> no, this is true. One mother happened to look at the textbook of this child and we saw that these 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 the Africans were referred to as workers coming Forgive from. Forgive me. I, that, yeah. that, 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 that one I had That's a that new before. one. Yeah. Well, I had heard that before, and but it's I too was, much. I was really floored. But, uh, you know, but the other thing, too, you also use his humor. Um, I live in Placer County, and a few years ago, there was a Fourth of July parade, and I decided that I was going to wear my neighbor's colonial dress, and I made a sign because this was Fourth of July. And when Je uh, Thomas Jefferson died, he freed... Sally Hemmings and his children, his children. Right. So I marched in the parade with a sign that says, I am Sally Hemmings. And I said it, I am Sally Hemmings. And when J Thomas Jefferson died, he freed me and our children. <laughs> and I <laughs> won second prize. <laughs> you are amazing. Oh. And I think that, that, that we will leave it on this. <laughs> Heather, yes. in 10 seconds, just tell us, what is your hope? If, we're, if we come back here 10 years from now, what is your hope? One sentence. My hope is to have gender equity in every level of government and in every corporation throughout the country. All right, well said. Okay. Um, Wish you both very well. Thank you. In Don't your I work. get to add a couple things? I wish that everybody, with the education of the 19th Amendment, that they will recognize the value of their vote, especially women. People yeah. died, suffered for that vote, and therefore I want everyone to honor that vote because without that vote, we will not be a good democracy. And we're going to leave it there. Thank you both. Nice conclusion. Thanks. That's our show. Thanks to our guests and thanks to you for watching Studio Sacramento. I'm Scott Syfax. See you next time right here on KVIE. For over 20 years, Five Star Bank has created thoughtful solutions to help the capital region thrive. From economic development and education to public health and safety, issues that are vitally important to Sacramento's prosperity. We're proud to be part of the conversation and hope you'll join in.